So Max is a very humble character. Max um, used to do all Rupert Murdoch's search marketing. Not to help Rupert Murdoch with his reputation. Was it Rupert, Rupert Murdoch's reputation or was it his wife? No. No, actually, Napoleon, you, you, you've got a, a thing for the dramatic. I was actually, um, I, worked, I worked across subsidiaries of, of news, and, and basically they had uh, a couple of startups, a couple of very successful businesses that became, um, you know, left the incubator and did very well. And uh, it was all about um, how do we drive, um, you know, traffic as well as leads, uh, you know, from, to these sites. So, I'm uh, afraid it wasn't as dramatic as uh, protecting Rupert Murdoch. So, I, I asked Max earlier, I said, how did you tell Rupert Murdoch about SEO? So, can you tell us, how did you introduce SEO to an old fart from Australia? <laughs> a very powerful old fart from Australia. Well, um, it was interesting. I mean, um, I, was, I was working in, in, in the central marketing team um, across, uh, you know, many different industries in, in, uh, out of the Sydney office and uh, um, my boss came and told me that uh, Rupert was paying us a visit so um, I had to very quickly come up with a way uh, to explain to him what uh, SEO was and uh, what, what I thought, I thought was I would be presenting this but it turned out minutes before I didn't have the security clearance and so um, I ended up just doing a, a simple infographic, a one-page infographic, just to show Rupert how he could join various bits of his organization together and reduce his marketing costs by 50%. All right, so tell us about, about News Corp. Actually, tell us about yourself. How did you get into search? What, what made you want to become a, a search specialist? Uh, good question. I mean, a lot of people fall into search as a last option. And I guess that was the case with me. How many of you here are, are search specialists? Official. None of this social media specialist crap. How many? Three of you. Good one. How many of you are social media experts? I came across a really good term in Australia, SMEG. Social media expert group. And if you know SMEG in England, it has a totally different meaning. But, um, so, carry on. Uh, you got into search by mistake. Oh, yes, by mistake. Uh, I mean, I did... Um, uh, university, I, I, I did law, uh, design, and, and, um, and marketing. So um, I actually ended up being hired by Accenture, and I worked for them in their technology team, uh, doing technology consulting for many uh, for a couple of years. And then um, um, dot com hit, uh, bubble burst, and uh, I went to work for a company called Hitwise. And Hitwise, uh, do you guys know Hitwise? Do you have Hitwise here? Yeah. yeah. Hitwise is um, <laughs> no comment. Um, Hitwise is a competitive intelligence tool. So they they look at um, they can compare your traffic against your competitors' traffic, and they can even tell you the the types of people who go to your competitors' sites, um, what their names would be likely, what um, newspapers they read, and what what kinds of cars they drive. What was interesting was that a lot of people don't know this, but Hitwise was an SEO company to begin with. So they developed this tool because their clients were actually asking them, how do they report, um, you know, success? What, what does, how do they actually report, um, you yeah, know, that they, they're doing well in search engines? So I worked with them for a while, and then um, I joined uh, News, and I worked um, across brands in, in their newspapers, uh, cars, employment websites, sports websites. Uh, they had the travel sections, and then um, from there, I moved across work in their real estate lead generation site, where they have um, an online destination where real estates pay lots of money. Real estate agents pay lots of money to get people through the um, through through their site. So that's where I come from. So, how much money did you spend on search marketing? Good question. Um, I can only say what, what was being reported in the newspapers, and uh, what's um, the you know it's it's over ten million. Yeah. It would be tens of ten millions. Yeah. So th this was this was a this was public information because uh, Google entered the real estate space um, you know about a year ago, 
and they've set up a competitive lead generation site for real estate agents. Um, so uh, at the time there was a big brawl and uh, we, pr we threatened to pull our search budget from them. So that's how we know it was, uh, that's why it's public. Alright, so you spent 10 million and how much revenue did that generate? Well that particular business was, um, it's a publicly listed company, it's doing revenues of about uh, 100 million. Not bad, 10%, yeah. 10 times return. Any yeah. of you guys do that kind of return? No? Matt? Uh, <laughs> mate, you're a show off, you are. What's your return? 10 times? <laughs> All right, so, so we're going to get into the, the dark black hat stuff soon, but I want to know a little bit more about social media. We went to this, you know, SES. Supposed to be about search, but it was all about social media. Why, why is social media so incredibly hot? Why is it people just stop talking about social media? I'm bored of social last media. The first one, mate. And the last. Yeah, change your shirt. Yeah. Actually, I, I mean, I, I've been in the industry for for uh, you know a couple of years, maybe a bit seven, seven or eight years. I've seen I've seen terms come and go. I think it's interesting that. Um, you know, there's so much buzz about social media, and I sometimes wonder whether it's it's self-perpetuated. So, do you think? Tell me the truth. As a as a search specialist, does social media really help your search engine rankings? I think it does because I mean, clearly, you can see Google putting in, um, you know, its um, social media media um, tweets into the search results. Uh, you know, there's all kinds of of ways that search engines are integrating social into universal search and I think um, yes and no because uh, the real-time search when they did eye tracking studies to see how much attention people pay to those real-time search results you know they're not they weren't really paying that much attention so I think it, it so does you're help. saying wait 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 yeah. you're saying people don't pay attention to real-time search yeah there was one study by one up web which showed that uh, people ignored the real-time search results in there so I think you are getting a position in the search results, but you know the other thing is, are people paying attention to that? And I haven't, I'm not sure that they are at the moment. Jay, are people paying attention to your tweets on Google? That's not what he's talking about. He's saying that, that when, you, when you search something on Google, and Google will return a number of different things, like YouTube, Flickr, and real-time results, along with their other listings. He's saying that, that the people skip over the ridiculous tweets that somebody's mentioned of that keyword and go straight into something more static. And I, I believe that. Is that what you were saying? Sorry, I didn't understand that. <laughs> <laughs> he said that you get a lot of universal results. You get video, you get photos, you get instant results. The people are skipping the ridiculous tweets and going to the images, the videos, the things like that. Yeah, that's right. I mean, I, I can't remember exactly how they ran that test, but it was some general test on uh, you know whether people were paying attention to the real-time tweets. And I think it was like, you know, with, with eye-tracking studies, they can check the path of your eyes as you go across the, the screen. So they basically worked out, you know, the, the, the time that you're spending actually looking at those tweets didn't make it seem as if it was actually being picked up by the viewer. Okay, so we're going to talk about the dark it's side. The, it's the whole reason they implemented it though. Huh? The whole reason they implemented instant search was because it saves so many seconds per user per search, which adds up to some phenomenal amount of hours or days or weeks per year. Are you talking about instant search? Or yes, yeah, so, so Google Instant, right? We're moving oh, on okay. to, it was a question I had here, but I thought we'd get dark and dirty, but we can go back to instant. I was talking about Google Instant. Else. Google Instant. Yeah. Who, who, who likes Google Instant? There you go. I like it too. Do, do search marketers like Google Instant? Uh, good question. I mean, it was only launched recently, but um, there's been, there's been um, people, there's been eye tracking studies that say it, it's causing people to actually ignore the paid search results. So, you know, they're so fixated on the changes in the search. As, it's, as people are typing it in, 
and they're not paying so much attention to the paid search results. So I don't know. We have to wait. I have to see what my clients are, are reporting in terms of the paid what search. What do you think, Mike? Is it going to last? Google Instant, or is it going to be like a gone in an instant? Will it last? It's better than what they usually serve, believe me. <laughs> I mean, All right. At the end of the day, the, the answer to that is that nobody wants to see you. you know, your, your last query brought back three million results. Nobody wants three million results. So they can bypass, sidestep all of that by just looking for the most frequent, most popular queries and give you back what the peer group is looking at. But when I, I, I worked with the guys at CNN and they said what they hated about the internet was it removed serendipity. So what you're saying is you're seeing the top search results that everybody likes, which means you, the ability to discover something new is removed. Well, it has been anyway because the most pervasive thing about Google is that Google has the entire World Wide Web at its disposal. But it's got less than one third. So there's always a better result somewhere else. All they're doing is making the most of what they've got. All right, nice one. So let, let's go into some dark stuff. You've got a few, you've chosen a few interesting stories here. Tell, tell us about this. I, I mean, we want to know what's happening on the, on the, the dark side of search. So, so tell us about this one. You can see it on the screens there better than you can here. Cool. What do you mean by the dark side of search? People who wear black shirts. <laughs> yeah, good question. What is the dark side of search? Does that mean well, you don't get paid? No. Or, this is <laughs> Uh, this is, that's an interesting question. I mean, the, the dark side of search um, typically is where people are trying to spam the Google index, trying to get uh, in, into Google um, by doing um, kind of tricky things um, with the search indexes. So, I mean, Google, Google has a very, very, um, how, would you, how would you describe it? It's, um, they've, they've, got this, they've, got, they've got this publicity machine. Um, and it tells you what Google wants. Okay, so they have Matt Cutts, who's a, a Google engineer, and um, he comes out regularly, um, and they've uh, to talk about you know what is good practice, what's not good practice, what's acceptable, what's not acceptable. And Google even publishes its own white paper on SEO best practice. And so I guess anything that falls outside of that basket of what Google deems to be uh, ethical practice is considered black hat and maybe it's easier to explain with some examples. Yeah. So yeah, Matt, we've got a few, was it you answering it? Yeah. We've got a few examples to show you. You can practice some of these yourselves later if you want to. Yeah, your website, Marketing Interactive, might need some, some dark side stuff. Yeah. Go ahead. So okay, just before I begin though, I'll give you some background to um, some of this stuff. This is some of the stuff that um, um, as part of my role, I basically was in charge of a, a research team and we used to research, then we, we would uh, create products um, you know, based around our research. And one of the things we used to do was basically go out um, and, and speak to experts and understand and, and attend conferences and just to understand what was going out there. Because from time to time we would see another site go up uh, from nowhere and uh, you know, instant success overnight in Google and we'd want to know what was behind that or what potentially was behind that. So part of the role was really to go out um, you know, and under understand, uh, like anybody in uh, what's called enterprise SEO, uh, a little bit of, of what um, you know, I guess is, is on the edge there, although we didn't practice any of it ourselves. I mean, the thing is that with, with enterprise SEO, usually it's actually very conservative. But um, some of these things that you'll see out here are pretty exciting. I mean, so tell us about this one. What, what is this story about? This story is, uh, is quite a, it's an interesting one. I mean, because it's, it's about a guy who made up a story about a 13-year-old who stole his dad's credit card to buy hookers and had a big party and then ended up with a session of Halo. Um, so <laughs> this was... Um, Sounds like you're my lifestyle, Phil. <laughs> So this, this actually made the front page of Dig, um, and as you, you know, as you know, Dig is a big news website, um, and and then it was picked up by um, by Fox Fox News, and um, and it was picked up as if it was legitimate news. You know, they didn't check the sources, they didn't check anything, um, and he ended up getting like six thousand links from that. So he made a fake story. Okay, fake what's story. this one? What's he doing? 
Okay, well this one, this, this is, you wouldn't really classify it as, as strictly black hat, but this is just um, a black hat kind of client if you, if you want one. This is um, from a casino website, goldenpalace.com. And what they, they used to be very famous for is, is pulling stunts like this. So they'd have someone, uh, I think it was at the Olympics, jumping off a diving tower with their logo printed on his chest. Um, they auctioned off someone's forehead on eBay to get um, printed with their logo. You could do this with a California Fitness, couldn't you? <laughs> you? You could auction off somebody's chest. Yeah. Who, who needs to get fit fast? Go, California Fitness, over there. Go and talk to this lady later. <laughs> What's Black Hat about that? It's not. It's just funny. No, it's not. But it is a Black Hat kind of client. Stop being so pernickety. <laughs> What, what's Black Hat about it is that somebody's going and doing, <laughs> tattooing their forehead. It's just link based, it's not Black Hat. It's PR. Mate, this whole, this whole event is link based actually. Yeah, alright, tell us about <laughs> this. What's going on here? Well, this one is um, the same, same kind of idea. It's basically someone buying a piece of toast with the Virgin Mary on it. So this was auctioned off on eBay. And um, it was basically, um, it got them a lot of um, publicity and a lot of links. Yeah. Is that is that a mushroom? That's someone's kidney stone. So that's um, Captain Kirk from Star Trek, and uh, auctioning off his uh, his kidney stone was bought for twenty thousand dollars or twenty five thousand. Okay, so tell us, tell us. We've got some people asking what is Black Hat. Okay, yeah. tell us. In reality, what is Black Hat search marketing? Can Forget we... about these things. Tell us what is Black Hat search. marketing. Uh, it's, Give it's, me an example of what a competitor of News Corp did that was black hat search marketing. Okay, um, we got some more extreme examples. Um, like, for example, what would be black hat would be, say, um, doing a, a distributed denial of service attack on a competitor, uh, e commerce competitor at Christmas, Christmas time. So, making their site go down or perform very slowly, that could be considered black hat. Um, so let's look at some more examples here. Is this Black Hat or is this PR? This, this one is... Um, this one's interesting. I mean, this one was a security expert, uh, an SEO security expert at PubCom actually showed, showed us this one. This was um, one of the techniques that he's seen out there where people write to Google to buy links. And as everyone knows, buying links is like the biggest no-no in SEO because that's... Um, you unless know, you're from China, right? Unless you're from Baidu, China. Baidu, unless you're working with Baidu. That's right, yeah. yeah. So, you know, buying links um, gets you in a lot of trouble. It can get you delisted from Google, but in most cases, you know, it, it doesn't... In a lot of cases, you don't even get detected. But in, what, what in very competitive industries, like in gambling, in pharmaceuticals, um, like, you know, Viagra websites, what people have been doing is sometimes they write on behalf of, of their competitor uh, letters to Google saying, you know, can I buy some links? Um, you know, I sent the check two weeks ago, did you get that? Um, it's just, it's just um, you know, little annoying things that, um, you know, help you get your competitor on the radar of, of, of Google as a spam site. They also Matt, have you got a better idea of what Black Hat is now? How about this? What's this one about? This one is, um, you know, um, where competitors, um, once again, this was from PubCon in Vegas, where um, they were basically showing examples where, you know, people were basically buying links on behalf of a competitor and then reporting that um, to Google. So what, you, what, what this was involved was they were buying links with a very distinct footprint so that you could very obviously tell, you know, this was a paid link. So it would have been maybe a million links from, um, you know, a thousand blogs on the footer of a thousand blogs or, you know, in the same exact pattern, so it didn't look natural. So tell me, can you go, is there a place you can go to buy links? Where, what's the famous market place for buying links? If I want to buy links tomorrow, where do I go? I think, News um, Corp, link, market, dot com? No, where do I go? That one shut down. But, uh, <laughs> where do I go? No, um, <laughs> um, Yeah, my lawyers are here. I can't say anything. But um, the 
I mean, one of the most famous places to buy links was TixLinkBrokers.com. It was, um, I mean, they're, they're basically a link, ex uh, a link site where you basically can, can look at, at different sites, different types of sites where you want to have links and you buy links. And the practice is actually quite widespread. I mean, you'd be surprised at the number of, um, you know, big brands out there that are actually involved with buying links. How much does it cost to buy a link? It depends what, what, what kind of site you're buying from. Um, you know, the older the site, the more reputed the site, the more authority it has. Um, you know, if it's a university site um, uh, in Latin America, I don't know. You know, basically it depends on a number of factors. But it also depends how much they want to sell the link for. So did you ever buy any links for real estate? I've never bought links for, for any of the sites I've worked on for, for clients. But I have, I have, you know, for my own sites just to test them out. And did it work? Yes, they do. Here we are. What's this? What's Scareware? Tell us about this. What's this about? Sounds scary already. Scareware. This was an interesting one because um, this this um, message here appeared on the uh, New York Times. Right? Um, they somehow found their way to um, get hack into the New York Times so that when you got in there, you got you got this message about you know infections on your computer. And what what you had to do then was you know once you saw this this kind of message, what most people did was was click, yes, I want to download the, the fix for this, because it, you know, obviously got a, a virus, it looks pretty serious. And what this, this is called a scareware. So, what, what happens now, you know, once you've got that piece of software, you've downloaded that piece of software, that, um, that person has a control of your machine. And when this is done millions of times around the world, or thousands of times around the world, you get a distributed denial of service attack which is like putting a lot of people on a train and slowing it down. So, so for those of you who don't ex understand that, explain, how does it, so you download some software, mm -hmm. and then what happens? So you download some software. You get lots of Indians on your screen. <laughs> I'm being stupid on purpose, but, so just explain. What happens? All right, what happens is that um, once you download this software, they have control of your, your site. So they, they can basically go in and... Um, they can make you visit, say, you know, Amazon.com, and this happens like millions and millions of times. But not not a site as big as Amazon.com. Maybe some site that that doesn't have as much resistance to, say, being hit with, you know, 20 million people, you know, per second or something like that. And what what can what could happen? So, do you see your browser opening and going to Amazon.com, or does it happen behind the scenes? It happens behind the scenes. Yeah, so you're unaware that it's happening, and that's um, this was done by a mob called the I think it was called the Ukrainian Fan Club. Are all uh, black hatters based in Eastern Europe, or Southern China, or Sichuan Province? Where where is the main congregation of black hatters? Is is it Perth? Perth. Um, good question. I think there, a lot of them are in the Caribbean. Um, that's where the gambling industry is. But um, it's hard to say. I mean, there's the there was a gambling conference I went to once, and um, one of the marketing managers there was 12 years old, and he was uh, Ukrainian. So uh, I think that tells you something about the the talent that is in there. Yeah. So we, we're we're in Hong Kong. Macau is like inches away. Yes. Is is Macau full of black hatters? If you go into the Venetian and have a, a quick session on the tables, is it all 12 year old Ukrainians, or is it? <laughs> Well, where is the black hat industry based in Asia? The black hat industry, yeah, Malaysia. I think, I think there's there's a lot of outsourcing going on in the Philippines. I mean, there's a lot of um, actually a friend of mine has has um, a team of thirty people in the Philippines, and all they do all day is is try to find um, places where they can plant links. So they're basically going into blogs and, and they're making friends with bloggers and uh, it's all run like a, a, a boiler room where they basically get incentives to, to place links in different places. They're looking for specific blogs um, you know, which, which uh, don't have um, uh, you know, a default nofollow on there and uh, placing links. But, and then there's other centers of excellence like in, in, in you know, Ukraine or, or Bulgaria where 
Um, you've got people who are just really good at churning out, you know, tons of, of feeder sites, um, you know, to basically spam uh, Google and things like that. Yeah. Okay, let's see if there's let's see if there's anybody who's come up with a question from. Uh, is it ooh, FTQ, show panels, clear page, pause tweets, new tweet. Anybody? No, we don't have internet connectivity. Matt, do you want to ask a question to Max about about um, about search? Are you still here, Matt? Yeah. Where are you? You got a question? No? Anybody have a question before I go on and show some other black hat stuff? Dude. Sure. Ladies first, man. Ladies first. Kenzie, ask your question. Was the 13-year-old who um, changed the Apple Daily site in 2003 and shut down the stock exchange, was that Black Hat? Um, or was he your cousin? My cousin. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, yeah, I think so. When... Um, what does he do? I mean, Please tell me that story. Well, I don't know that. Story. I don't. I don't know that that whole story either. But what, can you can you just explain the story? Yeah. Kenzie. Sorry. It was during SARS, and a yeah. oh, 13 year old hacked into Apple Daily and wrote a cover front page story that the um, airports were going to close, and all of the local population raided Welcome Supermarkets, and there was a big yeah. scare, and they ended up shutting down the stock exchange as well right. because of the okay. scare. It, that it turned out to be just this bogus front page. Bogus thing. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. When I when I talk about black hat, I talk. It's usually in relation to a search engine results page. So, I I don't know. I mean, that sounds just like um, that just uh, sounds like a hacker. It's hacker. like the Chinese going to CNN and saying hacked by Chinese. Really, it's just it's just a hacker. So what's the difference? Black hat, I think, is doing it for profit. Okay. No. All right, I'm going to ask somebody who knows. From America, you know that big country that has that currency that's going down very rapidly. No, you, you're making a. There's a difference between black hat hacking and black hat SEO, right? So because some of the technical tactics that people in the SEO world were using to get an advantage were, you know, somewhat similar. In style or whatever to uh, people that would do a denial of service attack or deface and hack a, a website or whatever that's not black hat SEO that has nothing to do with black hat SEO black hat SEO has to do with things like um, serving up one version of a web page to Google to make it think that you are the most relevant for a certain term and then showing a different page to users because it's designed to help them buy right and that's something that Google doesn't like officially, but they do allow some people to do it because there are legitimate reasons for it. So it, I just I think there's a big difference between hacking sites and criminal behavior and people who are not necessarily following Google's rules, but it's not illegal at all. You had a question? Yeah, I think I think that's a, a good point, and that's where I go back to the you know the Google publicity machine, and, and they have very clear rules about you know what they consider good and bad practice, but a lot of the, like, what we're talking about, uh, the cloaking or the IP delivery, uh, even happens on, um, you know, very public sites out there, like, there's, there's SEO mods had um, a list of, like, big brand names that actually, um, you know, serve something slightly different to search engines, because they want to, say, hide, uh, you know, say, navigation or something like that, that's specific to search engines or something like that. So, so yeah, my question would just be, yeah, go ahead and make a distinction. What, what is the distinction between black hat hacking and black hat SEO? Right. So, so did you ever get a news corp? Did you ever get black hat SEO? Did you use black hat SEO <laughs> news corp? Well, I mean, did you serve one page to Google and one page to the uh, Australian people who wanted to buy an apartment in Sydney? Well, what I can say was that, um, I think it was the New York Times, right? They used to serve up um, abstracts, right, to the search engine to make them visible. Chicago Tribune, yeah. You've got all these Americans um, in here, so you've got to be okay. careful what you say. Yeah. They, okay, they serve up one, one, one version uh, with the abstract available so that, you know, you, you get that teaser listed in Google. But when you actually click on the link as a human, 
uh, what you would get is a page saying, you know, I think it says it was, they had some way to monetize it so you wouldn't get the, the whole version straight out. What's wrong with that? I don't see what's wrong with that. What's wrong with it? Well, it's just, it's just the way that it's been defined. Google just wants to see, uh, doesn't want you to hide anything, uh, you know, from the user, basically. I mean, it's, it's, it's rules that they set, right? Uh, about how they, they, they want to see your property and how, you know. It, so there's, there is a lot of, um, I guess, debate about it. And, uh, and, and, you know, Google is sometimes ridiculed for its heavy handedness in, in some respects, yeah. Okay, so let's see a few more. What's this one about? Is this, here we go. Looks better yeah. on that screen. This one was, um, this one was a, it's a beautiful picture. That's why I put it up there. But <laughs> what it is, is it's, um, uh, you, uh, is everyone familiar with how Google, um, you know, you make uh, money with, 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 with websites, with AdSense? Anyone here? Who's? Just explain okay. it. That was a unanimous. Yeah, one unanimous one. Seen. Okay. Well, Okay, so, so you've got a website, all right? It might be puppydogs.com, say. And uh, you apply to get Google ads on it, right? And you get Google's ads on it, all related to, to puppy dogs and, and dog supplies and this and that. And you get paid, you know, when someone clicks on that. So you, you basically, Google gets a, sh um, a dollar for the click, and you might get 50 cents for the click. So you share the profit. So... What that means is that um, it, it, sometimes people abuse that because they might set up, you know, a hundred puppy dog sites and then they put all these AdSense on it and then what happens is they deliberately get other people to click on it, okay? Or they, um, they organize uh, fraud buses in China and get people around to internet cafes to click on and, and fill out forms to get money. So it's a, it's a big opportunity um, for unethical money making. So what, um, what you have here is a picture um, where they, they basically, Anchor Intelligence um, is an analytics firm. They've, they've worked out a way to analyze similarities in behavior and they uncovered this big, what they call a click fraud network. Right? And this was um, generating like three million US dollars um, worth of clicks in two weeks. And this was being run out of China. Where? Dorm Ring 1. Where is Dorm Ring 1? Your, your cousins in Shenzhen? In Shenzhen. <laughs> so so this, this graph shows, this is what, does, what does this show? I don't understand this image. What does it show? It shows that the white lines are the similarities in behaviors between different IP addresses. And this one is Bahama Botnet. So this was um, another case where it was, you know, basically doing similar things with, with click fraud. But what was what I found was really beautiful about this picture was you just see these IP addresses and this wave of clicks just happening up there. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about mobile search. Okay, is is mobile search complex? Is it hard to to do all this? Dark hat stuff on, on mobile search. Can't get any web server. No web server coming through. Yeah. Well, I mean, I don't, I don't know that you you need to at this stage. I mean, to I mean, what are you looking for in mobile search anyway? You're looking for usually, you know, the types of searches will be things nearby. You know, you won't be looking for uh, Viagra online or something like that. You know, so I think there's no real need. I mean, I haven't. I haven't really looked into spam and in mobile search much, but I know that where it, where it is interesting is that um, the way that Google actually um, uh, kind of they split up the, the the way that they crawl and present information to different phone models. Um, you know, they do it differently. Yeah. So I'm not I'm not an expert in mobile search at all. I mean, my ex my main focus was on enterprise search, so which is a di quite different specialty from um, that. And we had just gone into mobile recently. Okay, any more questions? Questions? Do we have any more questions? No? All right, cool. Well, we don't have any more questions. Okay. Who's got a big pop cards? Who's got, where's our magician? Andy? Come back. 
Andy, come back. All right, so so let, let's talk a little bit until we wait for Andy. I... I work. No, it's all right. Oh, here he is, Andy. Andy's going to do some magic. What are you going to do? Do a little puzzle career. No, no, this the cards. If you guess the card right, I give you a bottle of champagne, whiskey. 12 year old whiskey. So if you're brave and you want to come up here, Andy is now going to do some magic. If you reckon you can get the right card or whatever it is he's going to do, 